Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Luke 2, 48. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As Father Keith said, this is still Christmas, and Christmas is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. It's a season of joy and celebration when we give thanks and praise that God, the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. That He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a slave. That He who wonderfully created the dignity of human nature more wonderfully restored it. We celebrate the miracle of miracles, the incarnation of God Himself, and the beginning of His reign in the flesh as the King of Kings. These are wonders worth rejoicing in, and these are good reasons to be of good cheer. It is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. And yet, on the Feast of Stephen, on the second day of Christmas, we were rocked to our very core by tragedy. The collision of winter storm Goliath from the west with the unseasonably warm weather of North Texas led to the creation of multiple tornadoes that struck Garland, Rowlett, Sunnyvale, and other cities in the area, one of which was an enormous wedge tornado just across the lake that could be seen from this church's very doorstep. Altogether, these storms caused widespread destruction, tearing down hundreds of homes, damaging even more, and killing at least 11 people. It wasn't even two days into Christmas. I want to stop here for a moment and say that there is and has been much hope evident in this situation. And I hope to speak more about that in a little bit. But I don't want to take away from the sadness, distress, and for many, the dispossession and displacement that they've experienced as a result of the storm. I don't want to take away from the understandable cries of why that has formed on many of our lips. When something like these tornadoes happens, even in such a happy time as we are in, it is not unwarranted to ask the question, where is God? Today, I want to suggest to you that it's not far off from what Mary and Joseph were experiencing in our Gospel lesson. Being the faithful Jews that they are, every year in the spring the Holy Family would have joined their extended friends and family from Nazareth in the caravan to make their way to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover, which was the most important feast in the Jewish calendar and remains the most important feast in the Jewish calendar to this day and certainly the most joyous. It would have been their Christmas. It would have been the thing that they looked forward to all year long. Jesus and his family would have sang the songs of pilgrims on the way, the joyous psalms of ascent, including Psalm 84, which we read this morning, in anticipation of this most wonderful feast. After they make it to Jerusalem, they celebrate the Passover, they give their thanks to God, they sacrifice the lamb, they have their party and have their fun. They pack their bags, and the caravan begins to leave for Nazareth to make its way home. And at some point, Joseph and Mary notice that their son isn't there. Now, what St. Luke is telling us in this passage is not that Mary and Joseph are bad parents. They're not so incredibly neglectful that they carelessly lose track of the Son of God. <laughs> Part of what's going on here is that these caravans are so big and people are moving around freely between, you know, you'd have an aunt caring for your sick friend over here and you'd have your son or daughter going mm -hmm. off to play with their cousins in some other part of the camp and, you know, people, people just moved around freely. Jesus was 12 years old at the time that... Um, 
the time that the story is talking about. So he has a lot of independence in this day and age. So there's no reason for Mary or Joseph to be helicopter parents. They don't have to keep track of his every move. If he doesn't show up at breakfast or lunch, it's not really a big deal. But as the sun begins to set and the day begins to wane, Mary and Joseph nevertheless find themselves wondering where their son might be and if maybe they shouldn't check up on him, just to make sure. So they start to ask around all their families and friends to see if they, they've seen him around somewhere. And as more and more of them keep telling them, I thought he was with so-and-so, they begin to realize that he isn't there at all. When they did not find him, St. Luke tells us, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Well, that's a mighty understatement. This is every parent's nightmare. They must have hurried back to Jerusalem as fast as they could, retracing the entire day's journey, which was a long way, and keeping their eyes peeled all the while in case maybe he tried to make his way back on his own or if he was hiding somewhere along the road. But they don't find him. And they get back to Jerusalem and they spend three days, St. Luke tells us, scouring the streets of the holy city. They must have been in a mode of utter panic and disarray. They start off searching in the more likely places, maybe where they were staying for the night, or maybe a friend's house, or maybe a street that they had walked on on the way out. But as time goes on and they search in more and more unlikely places, the thought begins to creep into their head. Why in this joyous time has this happened to us? What happens if we never find him? Or even worse. Where is he? Where is our son? Where is our Jesus? They don't know what to do. And as they're thinking all of this, I think that one of them must have finally said to the other, what about the temple? There's no reason he'd be there. I mean, that wasn't the last place we saw him, but we haven't looked anywhere else. It's worth a shot. Sure enough, Mary and Joseph make their way to the temple. They find Jesus sitting in the middle of a bunch of rabbis, talking with them like it's the most normal thing in the world. As you might expect from a mother, Mary first breathes a sigh of relief and then begins to scold her son for putting her and her husband through this misery. Child, she says, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. And Jesus, as you might expect from a child, is completely befuddled as to why his parents would be worried. Why were you searching for me? He says. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Duh. I can imagine Mary and Joseph just gave an exasperated sigh, shook their heads, grabbed his hand, and took him back to the caravan as fast as they could. Whether the result of childish naivete or divine precociousness, Jesus' response to his parents is significant for them and for us. For Mary and Joseph, the temple was the last place they looked. But Jesus tells them that it should have been the first place. Here's why I think that is. He tells them that it makes sense that he should be in his father's house. In my father's house is the way that most translations have rendered Jesus' uh, phrase here. Um, and I'm about to do something that they told me never to do in seminary, but, oh well, you have to break the rules sometimes. Um, if you look in the original Greek, it's actually ambiguous what Jesus is referring to. Because the word house doesn't appear. It's just the things of my father. The, my father's house is a perfectly fine translation, and I don't want you to doubt it. But there's another way that it can be taken. It's the way that the King James translates it, which is 
about my father's business. In my father's house, about my father's business. Today I want to suggest that if we're searching for Jesus in the midst of distress, whether it's these storms or anything that might happen to us in life, if we, like Mary and Joseph, desperately seek him and can't find him and want to know where he is, the place where he will be found is in his father's house and about his father's business. In one sense, Jesus is right here in this place, in this temple of wood where he is worshipped. He is mystically present here in the gathered assembly. And he's present in the bread and wine that we are about to receive, in the bread and wine that's sitting in the tabernacle right now. If we wish to find Jesus when we're in the midst of distress, this isn't a bad place to start. But in another sense, Jesus is present in those who are the members of his body, in those who are the members of the church, and those who have been united with him in baptism. In other words, you and me, in our very bodies. In Christmas, we celebrate the fact that Jesus took on his own personal body. And he still has that body, and it's still with him in heaven. But on earth, we are the physical presence of Christ. You and me. And it is we who primarily carry out his father's business for him until he returns. Let me tell you where I have found Jesus in the midst of the recent devastation. I have found Jesus in churches across the diocese and across denominational lines coming together to help those who have been affected. I have found Jesus in a priest who has spent his Christmas break at the very site of the the devastation in Rowlett. I have found Jesus in emergency workers and volunteers, including from this very parish, who have tirelessly worked to pick up the pieces in the wake of these storms. I have found Jesus in this congregation, which has provided hundreds of meals for relief workers in a very short period of time which has provided thousands of dollars in gift cards and cash and in goods for those who have lost everything in a very short time. And I have found Jesus and many other people in our community who have done the same thing. Luke tells us that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. And the last time he tells us she does this is when the shepherds come to the manger and adore the newborn Messiah. She ponders both the wonderful things and the perplexingly troubling things. And it would hardly be the last time. We're called to be like Mary. We're called to ponder all these things, wonderful and troubling, in our hearts, though we may wish we didn't have to. We are called also, though, to listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit to listen to the guidance of the Spirit who spoke through the prophet that we heard this morning when he promises that God will turn mourning into joy. And we who are members of the body of Jesus Christ must, like him, be about our Father's business. There's still plenty of business to be done. The work is not yet finished for those who have been affected by the storms, and it won't be finished for a long time to come. This church has done so much already, and for that, there is just reason to be proud and just reason to, be, to rejoice. But I would urge us all to continue to seek ways that we can help, to keep our ears open for the announcements in the coming weeks, and keep our eyes peeled here and in the wider community about what needs to be done, about what we can do to help. If you want to help, if you want to begin helping, please do so. If you want to continue helping, please do so. And there are other things that can be done besides helping with the storm. There are so many other ways that we can advance the kingdom of God. And I would urge us all to pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance about ways that we can each be about our Father's business. The work is not yet finished, but Jesus is alive, and he still reigns. He is still about his father's business, and 
we can see it. O come, let us adore him, and let us join him too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.